Greetings one and greetings all to another edition of the Starry Messenger. I'm Edmund Sidirius, and today I would like to talk to you about fractals. Um, <clears throat> so, fractals, uh, you might, you're probably vaguely familiar with them. Fractals are some of those images you might see. Um, they have a somewhat psychedelic effect. Um, the Cox Snowflake, for instance, is a very famous one. Um, one thing I didn't realize is that they're a relatively recent discovery in the uh, 1980s with uh, Benoit Mandelbrot. Now, I knew Mandelbrot, but I didn't realize that it was such a, such a recent thing and that really an understanding of fractals and the mathematics of fractals was really only enabled by computer technologies and allowing them to graph these fairly complicated but the self-recursive equations in order to get images like this one on the cover of Mandelbrot's The Fractal Geometry of Nature. So... I won't go into a lot of the details of what a fractal is because I feel like the documentary that I'm posting along with this one does a reasonably tidy job of explaining that. Um, what I want to talk to you today instead about is some of the ways that I've been thinking about fractals and what they could mean for, you know, how we engage the natural world as evolved beings. Um, one of the things that Mandelbrot became justifiably known for is finding a way to mathematically describe the roughness of nature as opposed to the very even straight lines of traditional mathematics and geometrical forms. And that, that very roughness does a remarkably good job of modeling such natural phenomena as, as the growth of plants, the movement of water, clouds, other liquids... Um, and various, uh, even aspects of the human body, for instance, our heartbeat and the rhythm of our heartbeat shows a self-similarity, um, which is very fractal-like in nature. Now, one of the interesting things about this that got me thinking about how fractals could help us understand a lot of aspects of the human mind is an article I read recently on what's called natural deficit disorder, or conditions of limited attention, depression, focus, brought about, psychologists are proposing, by a lack of engagement with the natural world, or I'd say an unbuilt environment. By and large, children particularly, but also adults, are spending an increasing amount of time in, in rooms, in buildings, with all these corners that are very hard. Now, this is really interesting in terms of the fractals, because if we want to say that the uh, fractal mathematics of nature is what allows us to account for the things in the world that we're seeing which seem to show these patterns, and that human beings have developed and evolved as animals in nature, it, it would make a lot of sense that these sorts of built environments that we've surrounded ourselves with thus far um, would have a sort of evolutionary disconnect and causing problems um, because of that. If everything that we were evolved to encounter, or how our attention is structured, the things we're looking for in our environments, all have this fundamental fractal underpinning, then it would make sense that spending a great deal of time in an environment that no longer possesses that same fractal character could cause a lot of disruptions in the sensory processes. Um, another uh, point of some interest is how we, again, how we process uh, sensory information um, of a, an environment which, by and large, I think it is now fair to say, is, exhibits fractal qualities. Um, one of the things that the documentary above mentions is um, fractal antenna, and how you actually need a much smaller um, scale antenna to pick up um, frequencies when that antenna itself is shaped like a fractal. Not only that, but as it can be seen in mo uh, most contemporary cell phones, that fractal antennae are the only things thus that they've been able to develop that allow one antenna to pick up multiple different kinds of frequencies, which is very vital now that things are connected together in so many different ways. And this started me thinking about synesthesia, which I, I've mentioned before in, in this blog, but which is an uh, interesting um, physiological process whereby some people um, taste colors, uh, see sounds. Um, most commonly, however, it's associated with people who see specific letters and numbers with a color, and that by changing, say, um, if you have something that looks like an eye, it would have one color, and that, but if you make that into a bee, it would appear to have a different color to people who are, have experience synesthesia. And... It's interesting because, because my computational neuroscience friend has commented to me on several occasions that many aspects of the human mind exhibit a certain holographic function, feature, 
which is to say particularly memory and whatnot, is not necessarily localized in only one area, but is this kind of distributed um, quality to it. Now, in many ways, a hologram um, has a very fractal-like pattern underpinning it. Um, if you take, say, a rectangular hologram or square hologram, I suppose, and break it in half, you'd get two holograms of a lower quality resolution, which nevertheless had the same image in them. If you further subdivided those, you'd get more and more holograms of the same kind, but whose resolution had been radically diminished. Now, going back to the uh, fractal antennas and synesthesia, um, I'm not a computational neuroscientist. I'm a dilettante in many things. But it seems interesting to me that we should have our senses, our different sensory feeds and whatnot, which are, have evolved to engage with a number of fractals within nature, that they themselves would not exhibit a certain kind of fractal-like quality, perhaps on par with these fractal antennas, which uh, we're seeing now being used so widespread to answer a lot of human-made problems. Um, not so much in so that the entire brain is a fractal, because of course it does have specialized regions, but with the way that that brain um, processes and handles information could, in and of itself, um, func have an underlying fractalness to its, uh, to its workings. And this um, potential fractal quality of how the brain processes information and its relationship to sensation and the environment which we actually find ourselves um, in it's a particular interest to me because I'm quite interested in a lot of uh, cult philosophies, particularly the, uh, the doctrine of the relationship between the microcosm and the macrocosm, the, the larger ordered universe and the smaller universe, which is contained within the individual human being. Now, this um, doctrine was particularly big in the Renaissance. You find it in a number of uh, places in art and literature. Paracelsus describes it. Goethe makes uh, some use of it, particularly in his Faust. Um, and what's so interesting about this in terms of fractals and like the fractal underpinning of the mind and the fractal underpinning of nature is that mathematically speaking, fractals are very interesting things in which um, that which is kind of finite, the, uh, the, the image that you see is in a very real sense connected to that which is infinite because its resolution and its self-sameness just continues on and on and on and on. It, just, it doesn't stop until you get tired of zooming in of performing that calculation. Um, now, whether or not this actually has any practical consequences for how, how we think, how we engage the world around us, I, I think it does, and I think it's certainly worthy of much more investigation. And so I suppose that's the uh, thing I'd like you to uh, walk away from, from this uh, particular edition of The Starry Messenger, was an interest in how the everyday aspects, the very finite, limited things we find ourselves engaging with, are themselves potentially connected to a much larger, poten potentially infinite um, universe in which we find ourselves living in. Thank you very much for your time, and I look forward to seeing you in the next installment of The Starry Messenger.